So thanks again. My name is Eric Lunseth, one of the founders of the Skyway Film Festival. So thank you so much for coming out and supporting and attending. And if you haven't had a chance to see any films, hopefully you can. And if you haven't seen Blair Witch, tickets are still available. So we are showing the film tonight. And uh, after the film, we'll be doing a Q&A. I promise there'll be different questions. So you still may want to come out. And we're also going to be showing a little glimpse of uh, something that Dan's been working on. So we'll talk about that a little bit today. So, so a lot more happening the rest of the day. So uh, fortunate, so happy to have Dan Myrick here. If not known, he is one of the writers and directors of the Blair Witch Project. And a uh, little bit about Dan, uh, born, grew up here in Sarasota and uh, graduate of UCF. So this really couldn't have worked out better for us. We're Storytellers Festival and we're happy to have one of very most successful filmmakers and a storyteller as well as individual has some <coughs> excuse me some great roots here in the area so thank you so much for coming out good to be here right. yes yeah, it's nice nice kind of homecoming for me and um you know it's just amazing how how things grow and uh, you know there's all the stuff that's going on out in this area and um so it's a lot of fun for me to be here part of the kind of the inaugural you know uh festival here and it's just a real honor to be here and, and glad to kind of reconnect and see some old friends and it's, it's been great. Cool. Thank you so much. And we agreed we're not going to talk anything about Blair Witch today. We we're going to talk yeah, politics, sports, sports and, stuff. and politics. Yeah, yeah. So if, if that's not what you're into, I'm, I'm a sorry. Dolphin fan. So let's all, yeah, all mourn yeah, together. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So uh, graduated UCF. Yes. 93. Yeah. Around 93, you know, um, uh, I went there for the film program. They were, um, it was their inaugural film program. And um, I had prior to that, you know, shot a lot of uh, wedding videos and uh, was into, uh, you know, music videos at the time. And um, so I sort of cut my teeth in the commercial realm for a few years and then uh, heard about the, the film program at UCF and uh, applied, cut together a little bit of a reel. And, and uh, lo and behold, I was accepted. Wouldn't so. that be weird now if they turned you down? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's like, what? what? Oh, um, shit. Can I have my tuition back now? Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was cool. I mean, it was you know, the first time in my life that I kind of thought that, well, here I'm going to learn how to make feature films, right, rather than just doing commercials and kind of wedding videos and everything. So it was um, a real exciting time for me. It's where I met all my kind of cohorts in crime on Blair Witch and forged relationships there that uh, we work with till this day. And... Um, and it was a great time at UCF, too, because the film program was in its infancy. They didn't really have a hardcore curriculum yet. And, um, and we sort of had free reign. We kind of, you know, we looked at it as we had cameras, we had film, we had lighting packages that we could use, and no real rules. So we were able to do a lot of very cool stuff, unhindered um, by any, you know, any uh, hardcore curriculum. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And we got, you know, uh, stayed up a lot of late nights working on each of those films, but um, learned a lot. Yeah. Oh, cool. And talking about, you know, not following the rules, I mean, Blair Witch is a film that followed almost no rules, it seems like. Uh, yeah, and I'm so known for following the rules, yeah. and um, that's, you know, I'm, I'm, Blair Witch was really, it's interesting, people ask me how Blair Witch came about, and, and I think like most movies, it sort of starts off as this, at least for us, kind of this idea Ed and I had in film school. We were talking about um, wanting to do a, you know, a movie when we got out of film school. And, and uh, we both were big fans of those kind of mockumentaries like In Search Of and Ancient Astronauts back years ago. And we loved kind of the vibe and the feeling that those shows would, would convey. So we wanted to kind of mimic that, this, this kind of creepy kind of documentary feel. Um, and it started off with a single scene in the woods. We, we imagined kind of coming upon this house in the middle of the woods at night and how creepy that would be. And, and it wasn't until months later we started building sort of a story around um, on, on these filmmakers that are lost out in the woods that kind of get us to that house at the end. So that was one instance where it really started off with a, one particular scene and it kind of evolved from there and it wasn't until we were graduated like almost a year after our graduation that we got back together and said, let's do this Woods movie and, and then just kind of went from there. So was, was it a 32 page script and then improvised from there? Is that pretty, pretty much, much? I mean, right? it's like about 38 pages. That we, we outlined the script um, for several weeks and then I went off and wrote it. And basically it was a full detailed script just without the dialogue. So 
Um, we wanted all the dialogue to be improvised to kind of maintain this sense of, of realism. Um, but the, uh, you know, almost by hour, we had the actors kind of mapped out with each scene and what we wanted them to do in each scene, what the point of the scene was. I mean, it was very kind of traditional three-act structure. And, um, but we allowed them to kind of come up with their own with their own kind of dialogue and we sort of took this method approach with the actors themselves that we only let each actor in on what the character would know. For example, Heather knew all about the Blair Witch mythology, was out there to do this project of her own, where Michael and Joshua knew much less about it and we wanted that to prompt them to ask on camera, what the hell are we doing out here, that sort of thing. So we tried to keep the actors in character as much as possible, and we shot it with that methodology, and and, um, and it worked out pretty well. Yeah, it was also very unique. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people know the story, but they were their own camera people as well, so. Yeah, um, yeah. Neil Fedricks was our DP, which he managed the camera gear, making sure it was all loaded, and that the exposure was set right and all, but we handed everything over to the actors. Um, again, our theory being, um, you know, one of the things that we didn't like about a lot of mockumentaries or fake documentaries of the day is that, there's something about them that you can tell that they're fake. And it's usually some indicator, whether the lines are coming out too clean, you know, like you'll see some you know, fake interview in front of a Target store and, hey, so what'd you think about your shopping experience? And it just feels like an actor, right? And, or you'll see the cameras conveniently shooting in the right spot at the right time to catch something, you know, a story point or what have you. And we wanted to avoid those kind of contrivances. So we said, well, let's let the actors shoot it and they don't know what's coming. So whatever they react to is gonna feel very authentic. So we set up this arrangement, sort of like a play, like, a, like the woods were a stage and we had it all mapped out for them and their instructions was to kind of shoot everything along the way. And then we would throw a gag in like at night or along the way and give them instructions via these notes. So they were, we could control this narrative but allowed them the freedom to kind of be in character and shoot kind of uh, um, um, improvised. Um, so when we got the footage back, we hoped we'd just get a few of these magical moments that really worked, and that's what happened. And again, so it was a nine-day shoot, and, yeah. and then roughly what we were talking about, eight, 18 uh, months of editing? Well, it was nine, 18, hour, 18 hours of footage and eight months of editing? Yeah, it was a nine-day shoot. Um, you know, we had about a month of pre-production, then we had like a nine-day shoot, and then around eight to nine months of, of editing. And, um, you know, and the, the really like any, like most documentaries, really the narrative kind of comes out in the edit. And that's where most of your direction is done is, is in the edit process. So um, it was no different on this, and which is why it took so long. So you have a complete edit and you and Ed, I mean, were you just like looking at this going, oh my God, we have something? Or were you like, I don't know, we'll submit it and see what happens, and then you get into Sundance, then you're like, oh my God, we have something? Or how did that work? I mean, you never really know. I mean, this certainly, we're, we were passionate about the project. Uh, we thought it was a very cool pitch, and you sort of like can make an assessment um, to some objective degree by people's reactions to what you pitch your story is about, or viewing the footage, you get some real, you know, um, visceral reactions from people. So that that was an indicator that we might have something cool here, but to what degree, you never know. So our hope at the time was just to get into Sundance or some prestigious festival, and um, and that would be seen as sort of a calling card for us to get, you know, our next gig, our next project. Maybe we'd get a TV deal or HBO. Something would be like a huge coup for us. So. Um, so our expectations were very low, um, and, and um, you know. So, so the cover of Time ma Magazine was not. In that was not. That was not in the cards. Yeah, we weren't. We weren't thinking Newsweek and Time at that at that point. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was like we just wanted to pay our investors back. You know, we owed them like thirty grand. So I was like, let's hope we can sell the movie. You know, um, but it was, uh, you know. You sort of paid them back. We, yeah, they were very happy at the bit. end of the day. They were very happy. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then we got into Sundance, and and um, and it was pretty insane. From that point on, it we we kind of went into this surreal world of Hollywood craziness that none of us were prepared for. And um, and we're like, oh, this is easy. What's so hard about this? You know. <laughs> and uh, so it was um, it was pretty crazy, but it was a lot of fun. You know, especially for the actors. It's like I remember them at Sundance. They they had to take a later flight, and by the time 
I mean, they had to take the next day flight. So we had sold the, that first screening night. So the next day, we were the first sale at Sundance. So Premier Magazine's wanting to do a photo shoot with the actors and all that. So our three actors come arrive in Sundance with no clue of what went on. And we're like, you are on your way to a premiere photo shoot, right? And they're like, what's going on? And they were freaking out. So it was it pretty was much really, kind of like how the film was. They had yeah, no idea yeah. what was going on. Yeah, no, no idea. That was, we kept them clueless as long as possible. So, so um, you know, the Internet basically kind of still in an infancy stage in 1999. Uh, even though Al Gore had it for us a lot longer. But, uh, uh, you know, the marketing campaign and everything that went around this and, you know, began using the Internet, it was just, again, something that was, you kind of paved the way, it seems like, for a lot of films moving forward and, can't, you know, marketing and, and utilizing new tools available to you. Yeah, I mean, for us, it was just sort of a, like of a logical progression. I mean, it was the cheapest thing that we had. Like, Earthlink at the time was giving away free websites. So, like, yeah, let's put up a website, you know, and... Um, yeah, I, what you did with it, I mean, you know, the oh yeah, it was genius. I know we were genius. And, no. I mean, you know, for, <laughs> yeah, for a year on IMDb, they were presumed missing and dead. dead yeah, presumed, well, I mean, you know. yeah, we, we, yeah, we, we, we played that factor fiction thing. It was. I have to give a lot of credit to John Pearson, who um, at the time was sort of getting out of the producers' rep business. I mean, he repped Spike Lee and and uh, Kevin Smith on Clerks, and um, but he had a show called Split Screen that um, uh, was you know on Bravo he did his first season on Bravo and he would go to all these different areas in the country and do these cool little shorts and hire local filmmakers and Greg Hale the producer on Blair and myself we produced this little eight minute investor reel before we shot the film it was kind of a microcosm of what the film was going to be like so I got to work with John Pearson and um, after the end of our three day shoot I handed him this little investor reel and said hey John if you mind checking this out I know you get a lot of submissions but check this out so about a week later, he called me and said, Dan, is this real? Are you guys, is this, I mean, how did you get this footage? He was, he totally bought it. I said, John, it's all fake. He, oh, and he started laughing. So then he said, can I show this on my show, on the kind of the cliffhanger last episode on my split screen show? And I said, of course, you know, and he paid us a little money for it. And so that was our first chunk of change for the film. And then his audience saw it, his site blew up. And then he called us and said, Dan, you need to start a website because everyone's asking about who Hacks and Films is, you know. And that would prompt us to start our website and steer those eyeballs over to us. And from there we built on, kind of scaled up as the interest went up. So it was very organic. We didn't have any like big long range, like this is what we're going to do in marketing. It was sort of like prompted by the audience demand and, um, and grew very organically that way. All right, cool. So I'm sure there's going to be a ton of questions that we can, we'll get to here in a second. But um, so after Blair Witch, I mean, other projects, because I know you're currently working on a project right now. Yeah. But uh, after Blair Witch, kind of what was a little bit of your progression of filmmaking? I mean, you obviously had massive success. People are throwing tens of millions of dollars at you to make it whatever you want. Just I'm money sure. everywhere. And uh, yeah, it's still happening. It's no problem for you to make a film. I'm yeah, sure no, right it's not, so easy. No. Yeah. I mean, it's always a challenge. I mean, the, you know, the financing is always the biggest hurdle for most filmmakers. I mean, you know, 90% of what we do is hustle, you know. And it's no different even post Blair Witch. I mean, they, you know, you get kind of typecast and into horror movies, and that's kind of what everybody wants out of you, right? And um, but we did a couple TV shows, you know, a show called Freak Links right after that for, for Fox. And um, we did an, an In Search Of kind of, you know, reboot, um, which was a lot of fun uh, with Alan Landsberg. And um, so that was cool. And then, um, you know, I did a movie called Solstice shortly after that. And then I teamed up with, um, with uh, Tony Krantz and John Scheiben from 24 and X-Files, uh, respectively. Um, to do uh, a series of kind of uh, anthology series movies for, for, for DVD for Warner Brothers. So that was a lot of fun. And then I just shot this movie called The Objective in Morocco, you know, um, not too long ago that uh, went to Tribeca and, and uh, IFC picked up. And then most recently is this Under the Bed film I just finished shooting in, in Utah that hopefully will be out end of the summer or early fall so and that one's also that is based on a true story loosely based roughly on yeah there's a there's um you know there was a story about a guy that uh was a valet stole a woman's keys when she was in a restaurant and uh made a copy of it and moved into her house and lived under her bed for four days and videotaped everything she did um and the boyfriend found this guy and got and he was arrested. But my version goes much darker. It goes really, really, really bad. Of course so. it does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's, so she's presumed dead. Yeah. Well, yeah. you have to watch the movie. Uh, <laughs> and, and we're gonna have a couple of little clips of it uh, after the screening tonight of Blair Witch. I, I can talk for hours. Obviously, 
you guys came here, so I'm sure there's a lot of questions. So we'd like to open it up for questions right now. So. I remember watching the film, um, Blair Witch, I, which I loved, um, but I actually walked out with a headache. Um, I got dizzy. Yeah. Did you get a lot of that? Um, yeah, we did. I mean, you know, we were just talking about that earlier. Like, the film was never meant to be on the big screen. You know, we never really kind of envisioned it as being a theatrical release. We sort of shot it for, like, maybe cable will pick it up or it'll be an HBO thing or whatever. And, and it plays really well on a TV. It was sort of meant to be that way. And when we got the deal with Artisan at the time, they wanted to go theatrical with it. We went back and recut the movie to kind of take out as much shaky stuff as we could and to try to settle the movie down a little bit. Um, but still, I mean, it was all handheld. There's no way around it. Like, so I always felt sorry for like the first 10 rows of the audience because like, oh, they're going to have enough. They're going to have a rough time. But it ended up working out for why, us. Why do I need the poncho? Well, <laughs> yeah, why well, do I need a poncho? It's like a Gallagher skit. Um, but yeah, and then we'd have, we had, I would read reports about people getting sick at the movie, and it worked in our favor because people were like, were they sick because they were scared? No that was, it was, no they didn't have Dramamine. Thing. That was the problem. You no know? such thing as bad press. No, I know. It was good. So yeah, I, felt, I feel for you because it it's a tough movie to watch on a big screen when you're kind of up close to it. And um, that's why when people tell me, I saw your film years later in, you know, in my bedroom at night on my TV, I said, that's really like the best way to see it. So... I want to thank you again for putting UCF on the map as a graduate of the UCF uh, Broadcast School. Yay. Really appreciate that. Um, question for you. Um, what was the budget of your film and what exactly did you have to, what cost did you incur while you produced that? Well, it depends on where you assess the budget, what that number is, but you know, to get it in the can, as they say, was about 35 grand, 36 grand. So we post-production, production, and edit was about 35 grand. Then when we got into Sundance, we had to strike a 35 print. And there would, we couldn't screen unless we had a 35 print, so we had to raise 90 grand to get a 35 print. So the print was more than the entire budget of the movie. And then once we were bought by Artisan, they needed to redo the sound um, mix on it because in foreign distribution, you need separate M&E tracks and all that good stuff. So. That was 200 grand later. So it just depends on where you, you know, assess where the budget was. Um, but the version we screened at Sundance, if you count the print cost, um, was you know about 130 grand. And then all the enhancements, you know, added to it. And 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 as a matter of fact, Artisan had us reshoot the ending. We did five new endings, which um, at the time we were dead broke. So we're like, hey, you want to pay us? Sure, we'll go. <laughs> we'll shoot whatever ending you want. And um, they didn't end up using any of them, but, um, but that was an additional cost as well. And, um, and as far as, you know, incurring costs throughout, it's the typical thing in production. I mean, we, we, um, we used an Avid edit system at first, which um, we got real cheap. It was kind of an old one. And then that migrated to like a Media 100 box that we used, and we used After Effects for effects. And so we pieced together the whole process, the camera that we ended up using was something we got from uh, Circuit City. It was the, we got two um, Hi8 cameras um, from Circuit City. One was our our picture camera, and one was a playback. And then we returned one of them. Got I was going to say, did you return? Yeah, them? I got yeah. 400 bucks back from because yeah. so, they had like a 24-day return policy. And we're you know. Circuit City today. And where are they now? So much for their return policy. So yeah, uh, so it was um, you know on the cheap. Everything was out of our own pocket and friends and family and. Um, they had a crew of about eight or nine people, so um, and the you know the actors got a couple hundred bucks a week just to kind of cover expenses, and it was um, you know as down and dirty as it gets. And going back real quick, did you guys really audition two thousand actors for the that's something I read? Is Probably. I mean, yeah. we had auditions over the course of a of a year, and knowing that we were going to take sort of this improv approach. Um, and take a very realistic approach to the film. We wanted to make sure we had actors that were very natural and could think on their feet, you know, improvisationally. So that's a different kind of brain power to do that for an actor. Some actors are very good at coming in and reading their monologue and being a certain character. Um, but what we needed were people that could just adjust immediately to changing circumstances and had a very natural kind of delivery. And, so we auditioned in New York, we auditioned in LA, we auditioned in Orlando, we went all over the place looking for people. And finally, um, after probably a couple thousand auditions, um, we, we narrowed it down to a, you know, a select group of people. We workshopped them quite a bit to see how their chemistry was. And then eventually these three sort of 
rose to the top, and that's who we went with. Was screaming a part of this? Because Heather can sure as hell scream out. I mean, Heather was an interesting last-minute change because it was three guys in the woods, and um, and Ed and I were breaking up the audition duties. He would take one room, I would take another room, so just so we wouldn't go crazy, right? And she came into my room and just sort of like one of our techniques in auditioning to find out about their skills as as improv artists was that. Um, the actors would come into the and sign in for their audition, and they would get a sheet of a paper that said on it that you're in here for a parole hearing, and um, so you need to state your case as why you you know are at the, at, in front of the parole board. And so I came up with that idea because it was you know setup wise it's sort of the same kind of setup. There's a bunch of people behind a desk. There's a camera on you. You can kind of get into that character. So whenever they walked into the audition. If they weren't in character, they were gone. We already we already knew that they weren't clued in. So, um, so a lot of the times they would sit down and they would start explaining why they should be released on parole, how they've done you know done community service and yada 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 yada. And um, and Heather came in and she said, I don't think I should be released. I kind of like it in here. And she just gave me a completely different take <laughs> on the whole parole thing, right? And that really stuck out. And then she had sort of this kind of crazy kind of Geraldo Rivera quality about her that I could totally buy her like driving these guys, you know, to the brink. And um, and she really played it well. And yeah, she really did. Yeah, yeah. So it, it uh, so she ended up being our 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 main our main filmmaker on it, and uh, it worked out really well. Y you and Ed still keep in touch with the three of the actors? Yeah, well, well actually, or? Josh is in LA. He, he's a oh. filmmaker himself. He's done several films that have been in Sundance, so he's a very talented actor filmmaker. Uh, Mike Williams is back in, in Jersey, uh, working there as an actor. Uh, he has a whole actor workshop that he does there, and, uh, and Heather moved up to Northern California. She got out of the business, and she's kind of like a she wrote a book, and she's living with her husband up there in, in Northern California, so she's kind of chilling out now. But um, So, yeah, they all kind of did their own thing, and I've and, uh, done a bunch of TV since. But, um, but yeah, it was a weird kind of post-Blair Witch um, kind of environment for them because on one hand, everybody thought that we just gave them a bunch of cameras and scared them in the woods, and what a lot of people don't realize that you know, they're acting throughout the whole movie. I mean, they are completely aware that we're out in the woods and we're guiding them along. And they had a GPS um, handset that got them from point A to point B throughout the woods so we wouldn't have to kind of guide them, you know, um, so they could be more in character the whole time. And we gave them directing notes at each one of these waypoints that we had for them, which instructed them to do um, kind of in character stuff as, as they were walking through the woods. I mean, a good example would be we'd tell Heather to like, Go south the whole day. You know that'll get you back to the car. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And then we give a note to Josh telling him, like, dude, you got to take control. This girl is crazy. But let them decide when that moment would happen. This was Survivor before Survivor. Yeah, right. So it was, um, again, the intention was to have it all be captured naturally without it feeling scripted. And, um, but it was all acting. I mean, and so what ended up happening is a lot of the press just thought, we were just scaring these guys out in the woods, and 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 uh, they didn't get as much credit, I think, as they should have gotten because, um, you know, when you look at the outtakes and you see Heather just completely losing her mind, and then she stops and they check the GPS. Okay, are we at the waypoint? Okay, all right, back into it. I mean, she just shifted gears like it was nobody's business. And one of the kind of the iconic moments in the movie where she has that confessional moment and the snot's coming out of her nose. That was sort of, we shot that a little bit later, and I was sat and talked with her and said, well, can you need to go out in the woods and just take the camera with you and have this moment of regret and talk about with your family and your friends how you effed up on the movie and da 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 and Okay, all right. Boom. She went out and did it, came back, and I'm looking at this footage. It was like unbelievable. It's 15 minutes of her just like having a moment, and, um, and it's all acting. It's all just hardcore acting. Well, that's impressive. Uh, next question. Sorry. Uh, oh. I wanted to ask you a question. You said you had sold, you had sold the movie. Excuse me. I think it's on. Okay. Um, you said you had sold the movie. So my question to you is, and I guess every producer always asks this question because they always want to know, well, if I have my movie and I sell it overseas or I sell it locally or I put it out for DVD, how did you get paid and what percentage, and if I'm off base, you don't have to answer the question, but I'm just, just trying to get a feel for everybody in this room so they... 
I mean, it's fairly, I mean, think, times have changed a lot as far as what advances you're getting now and that sort of thing, but our, our basic kind of general deal was, you know, we sold for an advance. It was like 1.1 million advance. Um, and, you know, and the hard reality is that you don't see that advance for like two years later. It just takes it forever because basically what they're doing is back in the advance out of what they get at box office. But on paper, you know, you sold, and that's all, and it's in all of the press reports and everything, which you is one fine. Of those, you got one of those big fake checks, though, at least? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. No, they didn't do that. They gave us a foosball table, though. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, yeah, we got the initial advance, and then um, we got a fairly boilerplate back-end deal, um, which is usually, you know, 15 20% of... of you know, producers net, which is another way of saying nothing. <laughs> um, and uh, but what what really benefited us is, and it was really Artisan's fault. Their their one of their producers that was negotiating the deal threw in box office bonus points to close our deal. So after thirty million dollars, we would get box office bonuses after thirty million, thinking that movie would never come anywhere near that. And here's us naive filmmakers, box office bonuses, yeah! So they closed the deal, sort of throwing that in as a bone to us, thinking that we'd never get close to $30 million. And that's, ironically, where we made most of our money was on the box office bonuses. And that's a gross participation. That's like, <laughs> Variety reports this number, they cut a check, and there's no way, and then they tried to get out of it, like, you know, three weeks into the release of the movie, hey, can we redo those? And we're like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> so, someone at Artisan lost their job, I'm sure. Yeah, well, it was yeah. it was an interesting discussion, I'm sure, over at Artisan. But uh, yeah. but yeah, it's tough. I mean, that's the tough thing with 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 um, you know striking a deal. Part of it, there's a lot of intrinsic benefit. I mean, if you sell your movie at Sundance, you get a lot of press. You're one of the select few that sell their movie, which is sort of the holy grail, right, is, of independent film. So there's a lot of you know intrinsic value with that you 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 made something that's worthwhile and somebody wants to you know promote and buy and and depending on whatever the deal is is it a dvd or vod deal or theatrical um you get exposure and there's there's a lot to be said for that and can be a calling part card for your next real deal right um so there's you have to weigh that as a filmmaker and producer against the real cash value of of a sale am i and my investors are going to see a return on this, you know, because it is a business at the end of the day. So you want to make sure at the very least the investors get their money back and no one is left holding the bag. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's always that call. It's always that call. And then we had, we were no different. We had to make the same kind of decision. Is this, because Happy Texas at the time, which was a comedy, sold for $10 million to, 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 to Miramax. And we were like, holy moly, we only sold for one? And now we're getting in that mindset. Oh, oh. <laughs> Someone tapped me on the shoulder, you only made it for 35 grand, dude. <laughs> so, you know, it's all relative. And, and you have to be keep, keep your perspective. But, um, but yeah, you do want to make a living at it, you know. And the people that are investing in your movie want to make their, their return so you can continue making more movies. So it's, it's a tough call. You have to, you have to kind of weigh all, the, weigh all those things. Next question. Hey, so um, I love the Blair Witch Project. Thanks. I saw that. That was probably one of the first horror movies I ever saw when oh, I was cool. growing up. Um, what was your inspiration for that movie? Like, what made you want to create it? I mean, I mean, I know, I know. It's, it's. Uh, I've got some old family friends here that kind of knew me in the day. I was just such a humble little boy, and. Um, <laughs> I don't know, man. I just I love like hoaxes and things like that. I mean, I, I had this, I had this, um, I did this Bigfoot hoax in my neighborhood way back when. Um, that was you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm the guy. Yeah. And I cut out this footprint. Right. Um, we had a creek out back, and we, and I said, well, I'm going to put footprints all in the mud and fool all my friends, right? And and so I did that. But the footprint looked like a big duck print. So they're like, what is? That's not Bigfoot, you know? And I was had that sort of like I don't know a bit of mischievous I guess you could you could say but um, so that kind of transitioned into um, you know seeing like I said before like in search of and ancient astronauts there was a movie called um, Legend of Boggy Creek 
which was one of my favorite kind of mockumentary films about Bigfoot. So I was really into kind of that when I was a kid. And back in you know the 70s, it was, um, you know, UFOs were a big thing. And it was, so that whole conspiracy thing was very intriguing to me when I was young. Um, and so I look at Blair Witch as being kind of an extension of those early days when I was a kid. And, um, and I wanted to do something, um, you know, professionally that I was so, you know, jazzed to do when I was a kid. And that's basically the same, that's all I did. <laughs> and then it kind of blew up and went crazy and, and the rest is history. But, um, but the inspiration was back in those old days of trying to fool my friends in the neighborhood. <laughs> cool. In the back. You know, I, I remember going with a group of friends and there was two movies playing. There was Eyes Wide Shut and Blair, Blair Witch Project. And our group, we were torn because we wanted to see sex and then the other ones wanted to see, <laughs> this is a true story. How was that marketed? And whose idea was that to market the, your movie as a true story? Was it the studio? You guys? No, it was pretty early on. We, we, were, we took sort of this kind of mockumentary method filmmaking approach. Um, and again, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, I joke about it being a hoax and whatnot, but, it, but in reality, we, we, we knew there was something interesting about that aesthetic, about that real camera, home video aesthetic that was very scary, very creepy to us. It was sort of this minimalist approach to storytelling that we found very compelling. And, um, you know, it's like when you see someone getting shot in a, in a documentary, it doesn't look like Hollywood. There's just something really gripping and disturbing about it seeing it just off camera and it's, and it's kind of underwhelming in its visual kind of language, but very impactful when you know it's real. And so we wanted to tap into that. And um, so it was about, I always say, we weren't tr trying to make Blair Witch um, be real, we wanted it to feel real. And so we let the press in on very early on that this was our approach and that it wasn't trying to be a hoax and fool everybody. We just wanted to take that aesthetic. And if you were a fan of the website, you could live in that universe that we created, but you could click on the link below and sign up to our mailing list and get all of us our goofy exploits behind the scenes. So we'd be totally let in on the gag. So the press really embraced that, 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 that they, they didn't feel that we were trying to pull one over on them. We let them in on the secret early on and they really, really took it and ran with it. And the same with our core fan base. They really loved that they were kind of in on this and kind of discovered it themselves. And, um, and it wasn't until Artisan picked it up that they sort of took that kind of nationwide with it and played it a bit more as a hoax, where they had missing flyers for the film students. When we went to Cannes, they had spread them all over the, all over the, um, you know, the, uh, in Cannes all through, all through town. And um, so there was a little bit of that, um, you know, factor fiction that they played up on. They didn't even have the actors do interviews for like several weeks after the movie released, you know, just to, to let that kind of play out. And then eventually they were on, you know, Conan and Brian and all that. But, but to this day, I still get people saying, is it real? Is it real? And it's like, it's like no, it's just Google it. You'll, you'll see. But Boy, that's, that's every cast and crew's dream to have a production that explodes like Blair Witch did. How did your cast and crew handle post-explosion? What do you do? Well, it, it, we, we were sort of along for the ride. After a certain point, it's out of your control, and you just show up to where they say to go, and this premiere, that premiere, I mean, um, it was insane. I mean, we were at Cannes, which is when it really sort of went kind of worldwide. I mean, Sundance was awesome and very cool, but it was still kind of contained. But when we went to Cannes and showed in Cannes, we, we were rushed down to the, to, to the beach, and they had a, a Blair party there, and they shipped in like 300 trees and had them all on the beach. So they made woods on the beach in the south of France. <laughs> and we're standing in line at our own party like, what the heck is going on? And Just give your actors cameras and go, here you go, you got to do it again. Yeah, got to do it again. <laughs> By the way, yeah, yeah. He Heather, take the camera stand over there. Yeah, and just, you know, yeah, we'll, be, yeah we'll, 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 be at, we'll be at Chuck E. Cheese. Um, but it was insane. It just went, you know, and that's kind of when the Hollywood machine kind of takes over your movie and they just kind of go with it and you're sort of along for the ride. Um, we did a panel the next day with, you know, Ron Howard and Spike Lee and John says, like, what are we doing up here? <laughs> that was crazy, right? So, um, but I, but, you know, in retrospect, it's kind of cool to look back 
on Blair as sort of a case study as how the public responds to a movie like that and, and how marketing can play and work for a film that has no stars in it and it's very low budget and, and how it reaffirms my belief that it isn't just about um, following the rules. You can, you can make an impact both, I think, critically and commercially um, if, you, if, you, if you play it right. And it's a, it's a great case study in that respect and, and, um, and certainly everyone tries to duplicate it but, um, but we're still sort of amazed to this day. I know I talked to Ed about it and Greg about it and even the actors and we look back on it like sort of on the outside looking in that we see ourselves in those situations and it's sort of surreal. It's kind of hard to believe that it was us going through that. So, um, so it hasn't really quite sunk in yet. <laughs> Six, 16 years in July, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, we were, I mean, you, brought, you bring up um, Eyes Wide Shut, and Kubrick's one of my favorite directors, and um, we got a call from Artisan saying, I think it was Warner's that distributed Eyes Wide Shut, if I'm not mistaken. They said, we got a call from Warner's saying they're going to move their release date on Eyes Wide Shut because of Blair Witch's release date. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? You know, the studio's calling to move their release date because of our goofy little movie? I mean, that's, it just was crazy. You know, like, I hope Stanley's not pissed off or anything, you know. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it was it was uh, it just kind of rose to prominence. I think a lot of it had to do with timing. You know, the internet was just coming into its own. Reality shows were just kind of coming into its own. We were the kind of the typical rags to riches story, which the press loves to, you know to kind of to do. And so it was just a lot of things, kind of the perfect storm for Blair Witch, and made it as popular as it was. And I like to think the movie was decent too. So <laughs> I think we had a oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you know, obviously you had a lower budget than, yeah, than typical. Do you feel like found footage, that kind of genre, is a good uh, avenue for filmmakers to start out in because of the, do you feel like, I guess, it provides you with greater freedom with a smaller budget? Well, certainly, I mean, a lot of people ask me if we had more money on Blair, would we have used it? And I said, well, I mean, we would have better lunches and craft service and stuff, but but Blair Witch needed to look the way it needed, it needed to be shot that way. I mean, it, it, if, if it was too fancy or the production value was too high, it, would have, it wouldn't have felt like a student video. So our aesthetic by design was to look low budget. So in essence, all the typical shortcomings of budget for independent filmmakers sort of worked out to be our strengths. And that doesn't always apply. You know, I mean, sadly, I mean, you know, even myself today, you're always fighting budget, you're fighting time. Um, you want to get that one extra day in a shooting, you can't, you know, you have to find a location that costs you more money, you have to settle for something else, so it's a whole series of compromises, right? And, um, and it's always a fight, it's always a struggle, um, and with found footage genre, um, you know, the, the trick with that is making sure whatever aesthetic you choose, um, that it's for the story, okay? I mean, shooting found footage, um, shouldn't be your first choice. It's like, what's your story? What are your characters? Does a found footage conceit work for this story? And that's what it was with us. Our conceit worked for our story. Um, doesn't always work that way. And, and what I think a lot of filmmakers fall into the trap of doing, just out of sheer economics, because it is cheaper to shoot that way, is that they'll, I'll be watching one of these found footage movies and I'm asking myself, why is there a camera in this room, I mean, they've made, they've created this world that there's this camera, and like I'm watching a scene play out before me that the camera would have shut down by now. It doesn't make any sense why this camera would be, and so it takes me out of the story. So, um, so I tell anyone who's getting into that or contemplating that genre um, that there, ha if you're going to make your camera a character in the movie, which is what found footage is, then that character has to have every bit of reason to be there as the ones you're shooting you know, your lead actors. Um, so that's the first question you have to ask yourself. And um, can be done, there's no limit. There's no found footage movies are good or bad. It has nothing to do with that. It's just making sure it plays to the story. We were, yeah. Yes, I, I had a question about the, and how you approached it. Did you give them any kind of direction as far as where they're putting the camera and, and then like, w and like lighting the scene, did you do anything in particular? Was it more minimalistic and, and like what sort of freedom, was it like, okay, you can't point this way or, or that way and like, oh, you need to cover this, him or, 
or her? Or it depends on the scene. We had um, like the general stuff of them walking through the woods. They could pretty much shoot 360. I mean, right. We were literally in like full camo and hidden huh. in the woods. So in case the camera swiped by us, we'd see Ed and I standing in the woods, you know, and it would ruin the shot. They'd, they'd so, see Bigfoot. They'd yeah, because really yeah, yeah. that's like six, seven. Um, so yeah, we had to keep that in mind that we had to be hidden and camouflaged so we could, we could shadow them, watch their performances as they were doing and moving along, but we did want to get flashed by the camera. So in those situations, they had a lot of freedom to shoot anywhere they want. All the lighting was the natural lighting, daylight. And then where the gags, like for a good example is the tent gag where tents start shaking and they run out of the tent. That was rehearsed several times. That was like, okay, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna mess with your tent. Your instructions are to follow this trail. We marked a trail out for them to run on so they wouldn't run into a tree because it was total darkness out there. And all they had was the lamp on their camera, right? So they, in that instance, they were instructed to kind of follow this route we had marked for them and, and then hunker down in the woods, in, in the grass, and keep your camera pointed in that direction because we're on, you know, shaking the tent. So that's one example where it was much more structured and we did multiple takes to get it right. And another example was the house at the end. Um, the first take was a complete surprise to them. They were instructed to go in a certain direction and they come upon this house. So you hear Michael go, oh my God, that's a real reaction. But, um, but we needed to get them through the living room, up the stairs, see the handprints on the wall, top, come back down and all that. We, it took us two days to shoot all that. And it was multiple takes um, again, a credit to their acting, it was all cut together to make it look like one seamless take. And that was, um, uh, again, available lighting on the camera. We wanted to keep it um, completely authentic. And, um, and being a DP myself, I, I know when something's lit. If I see some rim light coming through a window, ah, fake, you know, I didn't want that to happen. So it had to be totally authentic. Even with the audio, if you're, I've had audio people tell me that you'll see when we cut to the film camera, you're hearing the audio from the video camera. So it's all very close to the mic. So we did no audio trickery. And we kept it totally real that the only audio we have would be from that, from either the DAT recorder or from the film camera. And we made sure it played that way. So, so uh, some audio guy would say, hey, I could, I could see they futzed with that. So we kept it very authentic. And, um, and again, those weaknesses ended up being our strengths. And so we didn't need a lot of lights. We didn't need, we didn't need to do all that stuff. And the most production value stuff that we had was like in the town where we had more of like, we were doing standees with the, with the townspeople with a tripod and all that good stuff. But once they were in the woods, it was pretty much all them and no lights, <laughs> except the one on the camera. Any other questions for Dan? Um, you told us, and I'm sure you tell the truth at all times, um, that you had a police officer question. Uh, I'm echoing. A police officer offered to follow up on this terrible thing, these children missing, and that you had somebody do a master's degree thesis on this piece of work. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, but when we, I got a call from a, a, a cop in Albany, and they're like, hey, um, you know, I'm Sergeant so-and-so, and, -so, and I'm, I'm like, okay, what's going on? What did you do now? What did I do now? Um, and I heard about this, these missing students, da da da, -da and it's very official, and like, I went through all of our records, and I went down to the county courthouse to find on this case, and I used to be a detective, da da da, in that area, and I don't know anything about it. Hold on, hold on, it's all <laughs> fake. And I'm like, and there was a long beat of silence. I'm like, am I going to jail? And then he started laughing. That's awesome. He was so he was so jazzed by it. So well, if you guys need any help, and you know, so you're welcome in Albany. Yeah, okay yeah, yeah. Are. So it was really cool, and and um, and yeah. I mean, it was it was uh, one of those moments. Like, can I get arrested for doing this? And I wasn't sure, but um, but yeah, that was that was fun. What was the other question, ma'am? Master's thesis. Somebody did a, a um, oh, master's yeah. thesis or something. And also, I remember you talking with some of the students who were looking for deep inner meaning and you were trying to look intelligent. It was really a shock. You could have been an actor. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, what, I, I, I love UCF to death, but one of our worst screenings was at the UCF film school. And we had a rough cut and is our alma mater, so we kind of go in there, and it's like, okay, we're gonna show the movie to all of the new group of film students, and they hated it. And it's like, oh my God, we, got, we just got reamed by the film students, you know? And I would have done the same thing. I mean, that's what you're, you're a film student, you're supposed to critique everything, right? So, and to their credit, they 
point out a lot of really big problems we had in the movie because uh, it was a big, long, rough cut at the time. But it was a brutal screening for us. It was just our, our poor egos took a pretty big hit. But but as far as the master's thesis stuff, yeah, I've had people several times kind of email me and say, I'm doing a report on Blair Witch and blah, 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 blah. And can I interview you for my doctoral thesis? And I'm like, sure. You know? But, um, but yeah, mainly it was the press. Some, like, pseudo-intellectual from the press reading all this kind of subliminal and subtext in our movie and I well I noticed you know this kind of points to the Civil War era and da, da, da. like I we ha I have no idea what you're talking about we just want to we just want to scare cut. people yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so you give me a lot way too much credit but I'll take it so but yeah it was a lot of people um, read a lot of, uh, into the movie which is sort of their job to do that and um, when in reality we were just trying to freak people out and have a good time with it and you know so but I'll take it. If it's going to call me that, then fine. So, Cool. A any other questions? No? All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. I uh, obviously want to thank Dan. Thank you. For being Good a part be of this here today. I, uh, thank you so much. Also, just real quick, I want to thank Charles and his crew from METV, as well as Janine and Patrick and Hannah, the crew here at the Performing Arts Center, for allowing us to use this room and everything. So. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, we are having a screening tonight of Blair Witch, and then uh, another Q&A afterwards. I promise there will be different questions. And uh, again, as I said earlier, a uh, couple of sneak peek clips of the film that Dan is you're editing. I know it's completed, but editing, or is yeah, it completed? It's, 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 it's locked. But locked, you know, okay. Final mix on it. All right, cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming out. Hope to see you around. <laughs>